All right, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this evening for Structured Support, Creating the 1830 Silhouette. My name is Brittany Garrett and I am the Collections and Research Public Programming Specialist here at Old Surbridge Village. Tonight, we will be discussing the hidden structures necessary to achieve a proper 1830 silhouette and what it's like to regularly wear these fundamental layers while interpreting in the village. Our costume staff often get questions about their clothes and the answers to these questions lie within our textile collection. So to help answer these questions, we are joined by Rebecca Bell, Curator of Textiles and Collections Manager, Derek Heideman, our Director of Collections and Research, and Carrie Madura, the Historical Clothing and Households Coordinator. Um, before we begin, I have a few technical things to share. This program is being recorded and it will be posted onto the Old Sturbridge Village YouTube page, which I encourage you all to visit. And there will also be a question and answer session following our discussion tonight. So I invite our live viewers to put in their questions at any point during the presentation in the Q&A feature at the bottom center of your screen. And now without further ado, I will ask our first question, which is a very important one. How do you get the shape of the 1830 silhouette? So to start off, um, I just, as you all know, we have a fantastic collection here at Old Stourbridge Village, uh, especially textiles, including not only, excuse me, garments, but more importantly for this webinar, undergarments, corsets, shifts, drawers, petticoats, shirts, um, just to name a few. So if you're gonna pardon the incredibly terrible pun late in the evening here, one could say that our collection is literally the foundation for a lot of what the historical clothing office does and what you see out in the village. So with that in mind, I wanted to start off with uh, one of the basic underlayers that women are wearing and go through some of the layers from a collection standpoint uh, that we have in our collection. These are, of course, uh, corsets um, of a variety of different shapes. These are after your shift or chemise, the kind of first layer that you're wearing, and uh, they're both uh, the first two, I should say, are both from Marianne Peck, um, probably dated in the 1830s. Marianne was born in 1816 in Providence, Rhode Island, and the brown pair, unfortunately, we don't know who wore them. But again, probably that same time period, 1820s, 1830s. They're all made of a nice, heavy, sturdy cotton. They're very well constructed. They're neat stitching, strong stitches. Um, as an aside, we had one corset going through our database that was cataloged as machine sewn. But when you looked at it really closely, it was just really, really neat, well done hand sewing. And there was not a machine stitch to be found throughout this whole thing. Um, so really they're very well constructed garments. Marianne's have fixed shoulder straps where you can see that the brown uh, corset has adjustable shoulder, shoulder straps, sorry, with the eyelets there. Um, and the structure is predominantly achieved through the different pieces that are constructing these garments, gussets, shaped pieces. Um, and as you can see, the shape of the two wearers is drastically different. So you're really trying to use the, the pieces and the shape of the garment to kind of accentuate the, the figure of the natural or the natural figure rather of the wearer. Um, so to give you another sense too, both of the two flat pictures are photographed with the back roughly meeting. So giving you a kind of sense of the, the shape there, even though they're not on a form. The uh, Marianne Peck, oh, sorry. Marianne stays are completely uh, supported with cording. So cotton cording sewn in, um, in the case of the middle stays very decoratively, in the case of the stays on the left-hand side, much more simplistically. The brown stays are a combination of cording for support, but also some minimal boning along the back, um, the upper back as well, and a little bit under the arms. So there are a couple of different ways that these are providing a little bit of structure and support. And as I mentioned, the emphasis is really fitting the wear and accentuating the shape of the wear, not extreme adaptation or alterations to your natural figure. Um, a book that we reference often in the village, The Workwoman's Guide, uh, was published in London in 1838. And it states, it's impossible to give any particular patterns or sizes of stays as they must, of course, be cut differently according to the figure and be variously supported with more or less bones or runners of cotton according to age, strength, or constitution of the wearer. It's recommended to those who make their own stays to purchase a pair from an experienced stay maker that fit perfectly well, and also a pair cut out but not made up so as to be a good pattern for the homemade stays. So these are certainly something you could sew at home, but you might also seek out some professional assistance for getting the right fit for your body. Um, and the stays could be worn with or without a bust, which we will definitely address later. The next layer after this is our next slide, the petticoats. 
Uh, again, we have dozens of different petticoats and a variety of different styles in the collection, bearing in mind that a lot of times folks are not wearing a singular petticoat, but might be layering petticoats two or three to help uh, create the proper foundation for your skirt. The one on the far left is a corded example, and you can see the cording is a little bit uh, closer together at the bottom and then spreads out a little bit towards the middle and no cording at the top. So you're really getting the structure down at the, the base there. Uh, again, cotton, very well sewn and put together. The quilted in the middle is a lovely uh, lightweight silk. Again, the bulk of the quilting towards the bottom, uh, much more minimal at the top. And this one actually incorporates some suspenders that you could wear over your shoulder to kind of distribute the weight a little bit differently around your shoulders rather than all at your waist. And the one on the far right is just a plain old cotton um, petticoat, no cording, no quilting, just a, a plain cotton petticoat. So kind of giving you the range of a few different styles of petticoats from our collection. So moving on, those are your kind of big garments, uh, some things that you might see out in the village, but maybe not. You may see some folks wearing uh, sleeves that require some internal support. The styles are changing. So this is something that towards the later 1830s and into the 40s, you're going to find less and less of these voluminous sleeves, especially the ones where the fullness is really at the top of your shoulder. We have a couple of examples of sleeve supports from our collection. The top one, uh, the pink stripe is a wadded example, um, very full. The bottom is just gathered uh, cotton, a nice heavy cotton into bands. And you can see there are little ties there. And some of our gowns actually have some internal ties in the arm size so you could tie the sleeve supports in. A few of our gowns actually have internal supports built into the garment itself. So there are some, uh, different ways that you could get that sleeve fullness if you needed it. Um, the illustration on the right hand side is um, from 1833 to kind of give you a sense of the, the sleeves of the early 1830s that might need a little extra padding. Um, speaking of extra padding in our next slide we've got if you uh, happen to need a little extra fullness at the center of your back, there were some small bustles that you could either um, make uh, the slide, sorry, not the slide, the plate rather, on the right-hand side is from the Workwoman's Guide of a few different types of bustles. And the one on the left is from our collection. And again, just for needing a little extra at your center back, not trying to exaggerate your shape, but just kind of fill in where you might need a little extra padding. So with those structural garments and supports in place, the outer layers would then be put on. But it wasn't just the ladies who were concerned with cutting a fashionable figure. Um, so you might have uh, in the next slide some gentlemen's clothing. Yes. So in this case here, looking at the men's clothing, it's also a lot of kind of using the human body as a foundation and then building the garment out in such a way that it gives a very fashionable silhouette. And literally looking at the image of this man's tailcoat um, from the mid to late 1830s gives you a very good example of the silhouette they're going for here. Um, you can see just looking on the right hand side of the screen, um, going down to the sleeve, it's a very narrow sleeve but the cuff is intentionally cut in such a way that it flares. So it gives this really kind of accentuation of the narrow sleeve with the larger hand moving up into a more gathered sleeve cap. Um, some of the, the earlier 1830s coats and even late 1820s coats will have a fair amount of padding on top of the sleeve as well to really fill out the sleeve cap. And that's gonna help to also kind of, you know, broaden your shoulders a little bit um, in appearance. We can see from the image on the left hand side of the screen, this is the pad stitching that really gives it the collar and the lapels of this coat, really the, the structure, the shape that you see. When you look at lots of fashion plates and portraits from the time period, and the collar is always this big kind of rolled falling collar that looks very beautiful. And that's achieved by multiple layers of interfacing, um, sometimes wool, sometimes linen, sometimes both, that is basically curved over your hand as the tailor is stitching it. And they're giving it shape as they put these thousands of stitches onto the underside of the collar. Um, so that when it actually sits on you, it, it has this beautiful rounded shape to it. Um, and again, looking at the coat and profile here, you can see how that shape has really been emphasized just by a matter of how it's stitched and padded and cut in various ways. So we go into the next slide. We can also see some other things you'll see at the museum beyond tailcoats, um, men's military coats. So we actually have a militia muster happening in just a couple of days here at the museum. You will see some coats like this on display then being worn by staff. Uh, and in this case, these are heavily padded in the breast. 
Um, the, the tailoring manuals of the 1830s do talk about adding wadding or padding basically into the hollow beneath the shoulder and, and kind of going where the breast is um, to fill up that kind of hollow space there. We don't actually seem to have any coats in the collection from what I've seen so far that have any real padding that's been added to it. You see the interfacing layers of wadding, but not any real padding to give a shape. That's not the case for the military coats, though. These are almost always padded, um, especially from the 1820s on through the 1830s. So the coat on the left-hand side of the screen, the blue and red one, belonged to John Minot Fisk, who was the lieutenant colonel in the Massachusetts militia, um, who actually was, was discharged from the militia in 1831. Um, so this was the coat that he was wearing towards the end of his military career. And you can see, again, from this perspective in the picture here, just how much wadding has been added to the chest and padding to give it this very full rounded shape. Um, it doesn't look natural at all, but it looks very fashionable for, for a military soldier in that time period. And looking at the coat on the right hand side of the screen, um, this one you can actually see the inside. This is a, a general staff officer's uniform for the Massachusetts militia probably late 1820s or early 1830s. Um, and in this case, you can see the silk lining and all the rows of the quilting stitching on the inside that are holding all those layers of, of padding in place so that it holds the shape. Um, we do have some examples of coats in the museum's collection where they didn't go quite as carefully with this as they were actually stitching that that padding in place. And so over, you know, almost 200 years, the padding is basically falling. So if you were to put it on now, you would basically have an emphasized gut as opposed to an emphasized chest, which is not the fashion of the time period. Um, so these are things you will see more commonly out in the museum in terms of the wadding for men is on the days when we do have the militia present, all of that, that wadding. It's a very noticeable difference um, in the silhouette of the wearer. And then finally here, just to talk a little about the lower layers, uh, we can see the pantaloons that actually came with Jomino Fisk uniform. So that blue and red one we just saw. In this case, these are cut in the Cossack style. So these are a type of pantaloon that become very popular uh, at the end of the 18 teens. They're based on the types of pantaloons that are worn by the Russian Cossack cavalry um, on the eastern steppes of, of Russia um, that were very popularized during the Napoleonic Wars. So these become very fashionable pantaloons in the 18 teens through the 20s and, and just into the early 1830s. But you can see here how so much of the cloth has been added around the waist and gathered into the band. So when the wearer was actually wearing these, the, the, all of the extra cloth around the front um, by the waist and then the, the very tapered narrow legs we really get this emphasis of all this kind of fullness um, around the, the waistline. So you're kind of getting almost like an hourglass shape um, with these types of pantaloons combined with that padded out coat that he would have been wearing as well. Um, these coats are sometimes recommended in advice manuals from the time period as being worn by men with ill-formed or crooked legs, um, but they were also just very fashionable in, in that time period as well. Um, you will not see Cossack, Cossack trousers like this in, in use out inside the museum because we do show 1838 and these really were not fashionable or not as fashionable by that point. Um, but you also in the time period might have seen men wearing very, very form fitting pantaloons as well. And again, in some of those advice books, they sometimes talk about padding out the form. Maybe if you want to have a more attractive looking calf, actually padding that area out um, inside when you put them on. Again, nothing you'll see here at the museum, but just to give you a sense of how they're altering, not their own bodies, but they're, they're basically stuffing things into their clothing to get that fashionable silhouette for men's clothing as well. So speaking of being stuffed into one's clothing, um, we have what is actually worn regularly in the village. And uh, I chose to put myself out there uh, to have these photographs taken. And what you see is what we are trying to issue our interpreters that are working out in the village. So this is the layers that you would typically encounter and all the layers that are underneath that you don't necessarily see as you're walking through. So the first image on the left is of me wearing a shift that is patterned from one in our collection. It is a reproduction that was made and it's very straight call straight uh, over the shoulders and has a drawstring across the neckline wearing a pair of stockings held up with garters and then the blue garment in the center is my corset this particular one was entirely hand sewn um, and you'll notice that there is a lot of kind of gathering and puckering across my midsection there's not much boning in this 
This one has a wooden busk down the center, which we'll talk more about those uh, shortly as well. So it has one straight piece of stiffening down the center and it has two pieces of stiffening along the center back to lace against it. That is the entirety of the foundation garment kind of creating the shape and quite comfortable to, to be working in as well. It's also not hugely changing the dimensions of my body. It's really shifting where kind of the flesh is. So it's solidifying it and making it easier to put garments on top of that. The next layer of garments to start building that foundation are the petticoats. And in the second picture from the left, what you see is me wearing three petticoats and a small bustle. It's one of the bustles outlined in the workwoman's guide that is essentially a gathered doubled over rectangle um, tied around the back of you. And the layers of petticoats I have in this photograph is a very fully corded petticoat at my base layer that really provides a rounded bell-shaped foundation. I have a second corded petticoat over that that has fewer cords, so I'm slowly softening the outer edges. Then I put the bustle on because I did want a little bit more emphasis in the back of my figure before I put the dress on. And then the final petticoat that I'm wearing, which is the one you see in the photograph, is a tucked petticoat. So that is simply rows of tucks. Um, they're each about two inches deep. And a petticoat like that could also be very heavily starched to give it some stiffness. We're not talking about petticoats that could stand up on their own, but they would uh, create a little bit more polished, finished uh, design elements to create a fuller silhouette. When you move to putting the dress on it in the third photograph, you actually see how much of the petticoats collapse underneath that. So that is one of the reasons we need so many petticoats and those extra additions of things like bustles and uh, bustle pads, um, because the weight of the skirt does actually compress everything. The petticoats, especially the corded ones, also serve the purpose of holding the garments away from your legs so that they are not sort of tripping and um, having things twist up in between your ankles and your calves as you're moving. Finally, the uh, picture on the right is once all the accessories are added. And so in this case, I have added a shawl, a collar around our cape rather, around the neck, a cap on my head, and um, one of our new bonnets. And so by then, nothing looks quite as extreme as those foundation garments where you see it very, very full in that center pic or in that second picture. Um, it actually seems much more moderate when all is said and done. That is one of the reasons we do try to issue a minimum of two petticoats to all of our interpreters and in, uh, that are wearing dresses, and in some cases three, because they need that sort of uh, initial oomph for before the dresses go on. And those of you that are familiar with our programming here out of the Historical Clothing Office in combination with the Collections and Research Department may recognize this dress. This is the one that we made uh, or started rather during last year's textile weekend and dress in a weekend. It wasn't um, it wasn't quite finished uh, last year, but we did get it finished for later in the year. And it's one of the dresses that's entirely hand sewn and having kind of very um, precise measurements on it it allows us to put it on multiple people that all sort of can wear the same corset size as well. So having a fixed foundation like the corsets and the petticoats then allow the dress to sort of fit no matter what. And so with that, that leads us to our next question. Great, so we have the right shape, but are these foundational layers, especially the corset, comfortable to work in? So going back to uh, our lovely collection, um, with an aside uh, for Textile Weekend this year, I was also in a corset and I have to vouch for the fact that all day long, I was very comfortable. It was corded. I felt supported. I did not feel squeezed in in any way, but I really liked how it accentuated my shape. So Mary Ann's is a great place to start because like the ones I was wearing, she does not have any boning, um, not even down the center back there, which you can see in the one picture. The one difference is I was not wearing a busk that day, but you can see that she has got a center pocket for a busk. Uh, again, like I mentioned, Mary Ann was born in 1816. This is quite uh, a small uh, corset, so she was probably wearing this in her teens or maybe very early 20s. And I guess based on her life dates and the style. Um, one thing that I love about this particular corset is the fact that the cording has been done very decorately. So it is very supportive, but at the same time, it's also very pretty looking. Um, she's got brown stitching that kind of accentuates the, the decorative hearts in her cording. 
we have a range. So we have some that are very plainly uh, corded that are just very basic and then others that have some stitching, some decorative cording uh, motifs throughout. So kind of like today's undergarments, you have your plain ones and then you have some ones that, that are a little bit pretty and you enjoy wearing. Um, so again, bone eyelets in the back there, really well stitched. You can see some of the gussets at uh, her bust and also at her hips that are giving her that accentuating really her natural shape. Um, so the really neat thing too about um, Marianne's, we have multiple stays for Marianne. Um, a lot of them did come with original busks, which is really neat to be able to put Marianne's busk in Marianne's stays. So the next brown stays are really interesting. Um, they'll look familiar from uh, the earlier slide there. They're one of my favorite pairs. Um, so kind of accentuating the fact that not everybody in the time period like today was the same shape. So again, these are on an unknown wear, but probably about the same time period, 20s, 30s. They're sturdy brown cotton lined with a tan cotton. Um, the shoulder straps, again, are adjustable. I've got a picture of both the front and the back there. Um, the Really interesting thing about this uh, corset is that the front busk pocket, you can see in the middle picture there, it had some eyelets to kind of keep that closed while there was a busk in the center. That has been completely sewn up and corded. So there are rows of straight cording down the center where that busk might have been. She's got minimal boning uh, along the back closure edge, like Carrie mentioned, um, also a little bit under the arms and a little bit at the top center back, just to give a little extra stiffness and structure. But as you can see, her shape is very vastly different from Marianne's shape, and it's really a garment that is supporting her in all of her glory and not trying to change her shape much, um, maybe just a little bit of cinching in, but definitely not um, extreme like we might think of corsets being. So the last one uh, that I put up is a really interesting pair that just came to the collection thanks to Carrie's Eagle Eyes at a local um, antique show. And this one is another unknown wear, although you can see in the center there was a name attached to it. Um, unfortunately, it's been modified, and so they cut right through where the name was. And actually, I should say, not unfortunately, but fortunately, it's been modified because that's part of what makes it really interesting. So again, the original um, garment was probably 1820s, 30s, but it has been modified probably in the 1840s for front closure. So the corsets that we've seen so far have all been back lacing, and this one originally was as well. But probably sometime in the 1840s, it was modified. That center busk pocket was cut. And two bones have been added to kind of support the the um, metal uh, closures there. So in this way, you could have it laced to fit you, and then it's very easy to take it on and off. And I will say I'm usually pretty agile, but my goodness, trying to, to lace and tighten, I, I couldn't do it on my own being out of practice. I know there are people who are very well skilled at that, but that was that was a skill I was uh, not quite ready to, to accomplish over textile weekend. So again, a close-up of the metal closures and a close-up of um, where that center front bus pocket has been modified for the front closure. So three different uh, styles, very interesting pieces in our collection. Um, and I turn it over to Carrie, who has much more experience wearing corsets than I do and much more experience in lacing people into their corsets than I do. <laughs> oh, I forgot busts. We were going to talk about busts a little bit. These are just a little... Um, selection from our collection. Um, Carrie will definitely go into more detail about busts and the wearing of, um, but I just wanted to basically show a range of some of the types that we have in collection from um, sometimes bone and ivory, oftentimes decorated uh, to much plainer versions. So the one that uh, appears black on the screen is a horn and then a wooden one on uh, the far right-hand side two views of that one. We have a few in the collection that have been over time um, very shaped to uh, the wearer. Um, so you can see a very distinct uh, S-curve. And with that, I will turn it over to Carrie to talk about busts and, and stays and lacing and all that good stuff. And broken busks as well. So the picture on the right is the same one you just saw in the previous slide uh, with Rebecca talking about. And, and I will add, and in some cases, the busks were shaped with this rounded area um, from the get-go as well. In fact, as we move towards metal um, busks and, and front openings, um, you see what is sort of known as a spoon busk 
And that is a broad widening um, that allows for a full uh, full abdomen that, that women sort of naturally have, especially those that have gone through childbirth. Um, so you do sort of see the, the slight shaping coming in. What we run into here in the village is breaking the busks entirely. So we have um, three broken busks. Um, these are all wooden ones um, from a variety of sources, um, but they were all worn and broken by the same interpreter who shall remain nameless. Um, no blame go to, goes to the busk wearer. We use examples like this as teaching tools here in the historical clothing office um, to understand what we're not doing right to support literally and figuratively what people are wearing in the village and how they're wearing it. Um, there's something that wasn't working here and so we needed to understand why that was. Now in the next slide you'll see that um, we use a variety of corset patterns. So the corset style that that wearer um, was wearing is um, I believe it's the, actually the first one on the left, which is the, the corset pattern is one by um, created by the pattern company Red Threaded, who provides custom corsets and um, stock corsets and so on. So really great shape, um, really correct 1830s um, proportions, uh, really fits a wide range of body types and body sizes. Um, but what you may notice is that it has a singular bust pocket down the center and not a lot of the cording and shaping that we saw in some of the other examples from the collection. And so both the fact that this didn't have a lot of side-by-side um, -side support to the busk and the fact that this person was doing a lot more um, uh, heavy lifting and, and a little bit more atypical labor and they're accustomed to living in 2023, the majority of the time, um, their body was not, um, the, the corset busk was not cooperating with the wearer. And so the busk kept bending and kept bending until eventually it broke and that pattern repeated itself several times. I'm not happy to say that we have, um, we are several weeks um, broken busk free uh, for this interpreter, which is very exciting. And, um, and part of how we got there was talking through those, um, talking through the, the challenges that the individual was facing. So we were able to determine that the corset that they were wearing had actually, um, they had, had had changed size a little bit. So the corset was now too big, which meant that the corset was allowing a little bit too much flexibility in all of their movements. So that was creating a space for the busk to be able to move and bend a little bit more against the body. So we sized them down into the next, kind of the next size corset. And then we also talked about the fact that our corsets are um, are made of wood. And we had a great conversation between um, us as panelists right before the, the webinar got started, um, debating the merits of different types of woods for, for busks. And I'll spare you that conversation, but the, uh, the sort of general consensus is that um, different woods are going to provide different strengths. And um, it's going to be the more expensive, harder to work with woods that are stronger and keep that busk straighter. But they could also be more dangerous when they break because they're going to have sharper edges. Um, so we want to find a wood that bends with us that we can, you know, shape and steam a little bit so that it follows the curves of the body, but also remains supportive. So one of the things we've had this interpreter doing is every other week or so, they actually steam their busk straight. It's wood, it reacts well to heat and moisture. And so anytime there's a curve starting to form that could eventually lead to a weakened point that would snap the busk, um, they're actually steaming it. Regular household clothing iron will 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 flatten that back out again. Um, and in fact, that's the same way those curves would be put into the busks um, as well as steaming them to shape. Now the slide, the rest of the uh, stays and corsets that you see on this slide um, are some of the other patterns that we use. These are almost all commercially available. So the first one in the upper left is by Red Threaded. Um, and then we have um, two sets of patterns, um, the second from the left and the one on the black mannequin in the center. Those are patterns um, by Black Snail. The upper right hand um, double where you see the back and the front is by Laughing Moon. Those are all commercially available patterns. So we are not 
fully relying on the collections pieces, but we are using the collections pieces to inform us how to structure the corsets, where it's important to put boning, where it's important to have busks um, to get, you know, to get some uniqueness and variety into the garments that we're making. The two remaining pairs in the opposite bottom corners, the one on the left is actually the pair that Rebecca wore um, during textile weekend. And you can see that is only cording up in there other than I think a little bit of boning against the lacing holes in the back. It's very soft, it's very comfortable, and it still gave her a fantastic shape. So we're able to structure um, her gown in a weekend, which is also not done, but it's coming. Um, but we were able to structure that and fit a really nicely tailored um, bodice and petticoat over that, even though it didn't have that hard busk in the center. The garment, uh, the bus, sorry, the stays are corset on the lower right hand um, one is from a pattern making book um, by Mandy Barrington, and it stays in corsets volume two. And that is a drafting manual. So for those that are not afraid of um, plotting some points on a graph and have a big piece of paper to do so, um, she actually walks through how to plot um, the all the points for this 1830 to 1845 fully corded corset um, that only has a center busk, but the rest of it is fully corded into multiple panels. And so it's actually a very simple corset to put together. And that's one that we're currently working on to be able to start drafting custom corsets for um, for our staff here. As you may have heard me talk about in past um, webinars and visits to the village, introducing stays that have firm foundation pieces to them is a relatively new endeavor for us here at Old Sturbridge Village. Um, but it is key to providing that kind of finished look. And for the most part, our costume interpreters are pretty excited about the idea of it. And um, and as you'll sort of see as we continue on, you'll see people wearing them in different ways. So I think we can go to the next slide. And this is these are all people wearing corsets um, about their daily roles here at the village. So doing cooking, doing straw braiding, um, wool processing, um, civic duties, talking about um, programming in the friends meeting house. Uh, we have our cheese maker kind of down next to the cheese press in the center bottom photo. And what you will notice is that in all these photos or what you should be looking for is sort of how straight their shoulders are and how well seated. There's no slouching. There's no kind of hunched over. Um, so many of us today are used to like being hunched over, looking at our phones with our, our heads down. And that's a really difficult position to be in when you're properly supported by the stays. So contrary to popular belief, they, they really can be a very comfortable garment and people are kind of excited to wear them because it provides more back support. It provides um, a better looking outer garment. And um, as we described to people when we're doing fittings, and especially for someone who has never worn any kind of corsetry before, a well-fitted corset or stays in this period at least, should feel like someone you like is giving you a hug. It shouldn't pass into the uncomfortable situation. It shouldn't feel creepy. It should feel very, very sort of supportive and secure. And so that's what we're always aiming for. There was then and now, you know, sort of the extremes of fashion, but that's not what we're addressing for on a daily basis. And we are kind of uh, honoring the uh, sensible women um, and men of the past who wore garments that helped them move about their day, not that we're flying kind of in the in the face of what the norms were. Um, that being said, as we move on to the next one, um, we do sometimes have some fun with the corsetry as well. So I know Derek's very excited for Muster Day coming up this weekend. I am equally excited about our Phantoms and Firelight program coming back in October. So it's the Historical Clothing Office that also outfits um, all of the performers for that. And what you see are two of our performers from last year's program. So Ashley on the Lyra hoop and um, one of our two um, flame sisters, I can't remember if that's Angela or, um, or Victoria. Um, and they are both wearing corsets, the same exact corsets that our busk breaking interpreter was wearing. Um, and, but what we did was change the materials and take almost the entirety of the boning out of it. So that Ashley, the, um, the acrobat 
could flex that way on the lira and have no danger of anything you know disturbing what she was doing but it still allows her to remain grounded in the 1830s atmosphere that we have here at um at the village and then our um, flame sister um she was able to work safely with the live fire and that was probably the least complicated tool that she was working with that day and um knowing that her garments were held close to her and she was wearing that actually over a corded petticoat. And so she was wearing the same types of clothing that all of our interpreters were wearing. She was just wearing it as outer garments. And we took some liberties with the fabrics and the colors um, and not sticking to those plain whites that we would have in undergarments. And speaking of our fire um, sister, that leads us uh, to our next question. Perfect. So we know um, all of the layers that are involved. And I think this is probably one of our most commonly asked questions. Are they hot under all of those layers? So yes, I mean, when I worked in interpretation, I definitely got this question an awful lot. And certainly, I mean, when it's a really hot day, everyone is hot. That's just the way it is. Um, but we certainly see in the museum collection and what we, we recreate for, for staff to wear at the museum today, examples of how people try to make their summer clothing fashionable, but still be much more comfortable in the summertime. So we have a couple examples here on this slide. Um, the one in the left-hand corner is the calico coat um, that we have that's been featured rather prominently lately at the museum. We have a couple examples of these in the museum collection. Um, and this is made out of the same basically dress weight cotton that all the gowns that are they're worn by the female staff are wearing. Um, so it's a very, very lightweight coat. This does not have any of that pad stitching that we saw in the earlier image of the black tail coat. Um, in this case, it's more providing a almost like a skin that looks like a tail coat of the time period, but does not have all the same internal structure to it. So it can be worn much more comfortably. Um, there's really no lining in this except for a little bit in the front where the buttons are to give them a little bit more, uh, a little bit more rigidity there, no lining in the sleeves. And we can see that here as well in the other images here of the, the white linen roundabout, also made out of a very, very lightweight linen, um, almost to the point of being almost too light. You, you, you think of like, how would you actually wear this on a daily basis and not shear it because it is so fine? And that's what a lot of these in our collection actually look like in other museum collections as well. But in the central image here, you can see this is actually the roundabout turned inside out on the form. And you can see how there's really no, no um, lining to this as well. All the seams are basically just whipped to keep them from unraveling. And then there is a little bit of a yoke that extends from just under the arm where you might be more likely to tear that um, down through the center back. So it actually provides kind of a, a waistband in the back of the garment. So it will add the structure just where it's needed, but everything else about this garment is very very, very lightweight and meant to be a very comfortable garment to wear in the warmer months. Um, in the next slide, we'll see an example of one of many, many vests that we have in the museum collection that is made with a single piece back. Um, so for a very long time, most of the, the vests that we wore here at the museum were made with a double back, um, which is great and they hold up very well that way. But we do have a lot of evidence of vests in the time period made with this single piece of shirt weight or slightly thicker cotton or linen, um, sometimes wool, but it still tends to be a lot of cottons and linens, even with the woolen vests. So in this case, it's literally just a single piece that has a rolled hem around basically the back of the arm side and then the, the lower edge here. So it'd be very comfortable to wear in the summer months. Um, we can see from the image here, this is from Hazen's Panorama of the Trades from 1836. Um, we use this as a, a reference a lot at the museum for showing how various people working would actually dress in the time period, along with you know genre paintings and other references that we have, things written down in diaries and the rest. But in this image of the blacksmith, and I mean, I worked in the blacksmith shop here for 20 years. Um, it was always very hot in the summertime. And a lot of us do tend to just work in our shirts, usually still with our cravats on or our neckerchiefs on. Um, but in this image here, we can see kind of a, a spectrum here. We can see the smith who's actually directing the work is not appearing to actually wear any kind of vest. He's wearing a bibbed apron that's covering his shirt instead. Whereas with his two strikers, one of them appears to be wearing a vest and no apron and the other one, no vest and an apron. Um, the man at the, bench, at the bench behind, it's kind of hard to actually see. But we, we've had to kind of struggle with this at the museum and, and, and how we're portraying clothing um, to the public, because although this, it might be very appropriate to wear just your shirt and have your, you know, your cravat open, your shirt open, all that, um, it's not always the best look at the same time. So we, we really have tried to structure how staff dress and how many layers they're allowed to kind of remove 
based on historical research, but also kind of trying to tread that line of what also looks, you know, kind of professional for the public to see. You know, we're we're showing people in an 1830s environment, in some cases, in a way that would be very, um, very kind of private, you know, working on your own farm, sure, you might decide not to wear your vest while you're out mucking out the stalls in the morning, because you're just doing that in the morning before breakfast, there's no one around. But of course, we have visitors around all the time. So we have to tread that line differently. Um, if we go on to the next slide, as a little bit of a wild card to the situation, we have another print from Hazen's Panorama of the Trades. In this case, it's a printer. And the neat thing about this, you can see he has his sleeves completely rolled up really high, which is what we also see with images of blacksmiths and, and potters working in the period um, so that their shirt is not going to be soiled by the work we're doing. But in this case, too, you can see up in the upper right-hand corner, um, his hat and his cravat are actually hanging on a peg on the side of the press. So when he came into work. It could be this was a hot day, but there are other images I've seen showing printers working where they were actually hanging up their cravats, seemingly out of fear that the dangling ends would actually be impacted by the ink. I mean, they're not worried about the cravat getting stuck in the machine and getting sucked in. They're running at themselves. So if they do that, this, they're really doing something wrong. Um, but getting them damaged when you have that nice new silk cravat that you, you, know, you, you wore into the office effectively, um, certainly hanging it up and getting it out of the way would be a good way to, to protect it. All right, so we can move on to our next slide and talk about some of our other handkerchiefs. Um, Carrie, I'll turn this over to you. Sure. Um, so speaking of handkerchiefs, these are garments worn by both men and women, um, or those wearing traditional men's clothing and traditional women's clothing. And um, they can serve, so they can serve multiple purposes. They can keep you cool on a hot day. They can absorb sweat inside your clothing. They can be dampened to give you something cooling against your neck. They can be worn over the top of a dress to kind of protect that. So it's, and give you another layer before a fire. So it, it does tie into the, are you hot in this, but they're providing layers both close to the skin and all the way on the outside. The reason we showed these two in particular is that um, we do have an exciting announcement. Um, we've just collaborated with Burnley and Trowbridge to bring some of our amazing handkerchief um, collection to life. And these are two of the ones that are going to be, be um, reproduced by Burnley and Trowbridge. We'll keep you posted as this journey continues, but we definitely can't wait to uh, wear a part of history and offer it to you too. So we do use a variety of handkerchiefs currently um, but the variety of them is pretty limited. So we're very excited to be able to not only use Burnley and Trowbridge as a supplier for other handkerchiefs, but to soon have some that truly represent Old Sturbridge Village's collection as well. We also have worked with some of our staff to kind of hand dye and hand print some um, handkerchiefs so that um, we can add some variety there. What we know, and actually I might ask Derek to jump back in um, for this too, because um, there is sort of a very well-known quote about, or well-known reference to um, how many people are wearing handkerchiefs in this, or the printed handkerchiefs. Can you speak to that? Oh, yes. I, I actually, I should have looked this up again before the webinar. There's actually an account from a European observer in the 1820s um, who is actually, I believe he's he's kind of attending um, the Senate and he's kind of looking at all these other, these politicians doing their work. And he's remarking how common it was to see men wearing these printed cotton, you know, very colorful um, cravats, even in a setting that might be considered to be a little bit more formal on the floor of the Senate. Um, it's kind of an interesting remark from a European. Thank you. So yeah, so the printed cottons or printed cottons in a variety of ways is really where it's at. And um, and I won't say that there's a limit to how many prints. Uh, we do have some references from uh, Lydia Mariah Child saying, you know, how many prints you should have in your household. She kind of marks it at seven is sort of that limit. Um, we try not to go to that many prints for the clothing. But then again, you never know what's going to happen. So in the next slide, you'll see a number of our interpreters um, sort of at work um, in sort of different situations. And in some cases, you might be surprised as to why sleeves are rolled up or not rolled up. So as Derek said earlier, if it's a hot day, you're going to be hot. It sort of doesn't matter what you're wearing. So the outside temperature is one factor. And if you want to get some, you know, cool air coming across your, um, coming across your arms on a hot day and working in the blacksmith, that totally makes sense. However, if you are going to be working the dye pit, which you see in the large photo to, um, on the right, um, 
she is most definitely wearing her sleeves down. And part of that is to be protective against the heat of the fire and the heat of the sun. So she may physically feel warm, but her, her clothing may not react to that, or she may add more layers like another handkerchief or the um, more complete um, over apron that you see her wearing there. Conversely, the farmer's um, hanging in the lower left-hand photo, you actually see a variety. You see some with sleeves rolled up. Um, so that's where their comfort is. And that's where they, you know, they want to keep those arms cool. You see the farmer in the, uh, to all the way to the left. He has his vest unbuttoned, his shirt undone, um, but his sleeves down. So, and he's sort of creating some more air and that might be a time where a handkerchief is worn close to the neck um, to sort of absorb some of that sweat. Then we have the farmer who is on um, top of the hay wagon and he's staying fully covered. And that could be someone that doesn't want the itchiness of, you know, sort of loose hay to be getting inside his clothing. And so, yes, he might be hot um, or, you know, what we would think of as uncomfortable today, but it's actually more protective to have the clothing on. Last but not least, the photo in the upper left is at the is at the Freeman farmhouse. And while our um, interpreter is working at the table and or quite which is mixing in this photo, um, but she's working and clearly working with her hands and is not going to want to get dough and um, ingredients all the way up her arms. So sleeves are rolled up for that, but actually putting things onto the fire and baking with them on whether it's a hot day or a cold day, but getting your hands that close to the fire, you wouldn't necessarily want to have your sleeves rolled up. You'd actually want that layer of clothing protecting you and serving as a barrier. We also find that comes in handy with the amount of skirts and the petticoats. Like it's very rare that you're going to feel the heat of the fire around um, your lower half if you're wearing dresses because there are so many layers between you um, and, the, um, and the heat source as well. The other thing that we do have to keep in mind as we're addressing interpreters in 2023 is that there are sometimes, as Derek was alluding to, there are some tasks that um, wouldn't have necessarily been done during the hottest part of the day. So gardening is one example. So, so a lot of the gardening typically then and now, you would try to do it in the cooler parts of the day. Try not to be gardening from you know 10 in the morning until two in the afternoon. We know that from a scientific point of view, but people in the 1830s had the common sense to not to know that's you know not to be out in that hottest part of the day if it was possible. However, we haven't been able to encourage visitors too much to come at six o'clock in the morning and watch our gardeners working. Um, so in that case, you know, our gardeners are working throughout what is some of the, the warmer parts of the day. So there are certain concessions we make there too, to the amount of layers that they wear. Um, some of the sunbonnets and the head coverings they wear might not be what you would see in 1830s polite company, but it is the safest um, solution that also has 1830s precedents, but is a good safe solution for our staff who live and work in 2023 as well. So it is, it's always that, that sort of balancing game to find the best of what works and represents the late 1830s in terms of our clothing and um, outfitting people, but also taking advantage of the common sense and um, the scientific knowledge we've gained in 2023 as well. Great, so they're working in the hot sun, they're sweating. How do they stay clean? And also tied to that question, which does get asked, how do they use the bathroom? So to start off, um, laundry and ironing were two um, tasks that were pretty much tackled on a weekly basis by most families, um, depending on the nature of your family, you certainly have the, the woman of the house undertaking it, but certainly utilizing other help as necessary because they were big, they were big tasks. Um, so a couple of things you see in the slide here on the left hand side is a washing machine from our collection, probably uh, in the sort of early to mid 19th century, not something that every family had. Um, in fact, a lot of the things that needed to be laundered frequently would not necessarily need something as elaborate as this. A lot of the uh, objects, or I should say clothing, that's closest to your skin is going to be uh, white cotton, white linen, something very easy to launder. Boil it in uh, a pot of water um, for 10 or so minutes to lift some of the oils and dirts that have accumulated because, of course, 
those are the layers closest to your skin. And as you're sweating and doing some of this work, hopefully it's catching most of your um, grit and grime from your body and keeping your other garments a little bit cleaner. So you might find folks using a combination of techniques to keep their garments um, clean. Things that are worn closest to your skin are definitely going to be the things that you're cleaning and laundering most frequently. You might have multiples of things like your shirts and your shifts um, so that you can rotate. Often after laundry would come, usually the next day after ironing, which is not only going to um, help you keep your outer garments uh, looking very presentable, and of course, going along with that, you might be starching uh, quite a few things, caps and capes and whatnot. But um, ironing can actually help soften some of the fibers, especially the linen fibers. So the more they're laundered and the more they're ironed, the softer and more comfortable against your skin they can become. Um, so you've got a uh, lady uh, in the image there hanging up some of the laundry to dry. Um, which also has the added advantage of using the sun to help, again, act as a bleaching agent for some of these white garments. So laundry and ironing, especially in the summertime, we've all been uh, dealing with a lot of hot days and a lot of soupy days. So uh, sweating um, and getting your, your sort of undergarments dirty is definitely something that you had to deal with then and now. Um, and I think speaking of sweat stains, one of my favorite things um, in the collection because we've got uh, garments like the shifts, like the shirts that are relatively clean, all things uh, told, they're protecting your outer garments, but even so, you know, you've got dresses like this lovely silk dress that clearly shows evidence of being worn. Um, you can see under the armpit sweat stains um, because you're not necessarily going to be laundering some of your garments, especially your silk garments um, at all or uh, certainly some of your, your nicer gowns, even the cotton ones, maybe they are getting laundered a little bit less frequently as needed. Um, this gown is actually really interesting. Um, it has the sweat stains, but it also has patches under the arms where um, the, the fabric actually rotted away a little bit. And uh, she had some of the silk left and was able to do little patches under her arms. But it's really neat to kind of take a look at garments like this because it shows that there was a real person who wore this thing um, and did actual activities in this, in this garment from the 1830s. And uh, last but not least, drawers. So again, as we've been talking about, some things are not necessarily issued to the folks working out and about in the village. Um, and these are a couple of drawers, a white cotton pair to the left and a red flannel uh, wool pair to the right, um, but not something that you necessarily will be encountering out in the village, something that some people of the period uh, chose to wear for ladies. A lot of the examples we have in the collections are these split drawers where it's basically two legs attached into a waistband. So it makes uh, using the restroom a lot more convenient, um, shall we say. But again, something that, uh, for instance, the Workwoman's Guide recommends uh, invalids wearing flannel drawers as kind of a, an extra layer against their skin. They are going close to your skin. So presumably they are also catching some of that, that dirt and sweat and grime from your body. Um, and as you can see in the white pair, that's another one that would be very easy to launder as needed. So moving on to the men's clothing, we have an example here of a very typical man's shirt um, from the 1825 to 1840 period. Um, the shirt being the closest layer to the skin for men um, and one that would be laundered very frequently, very, very commonly made out of a white cotton or linen in this time period. Um, there are certainly some examples and discussion of different types of shirts or different patterns of cloth that were used, um, whether they be checked or striped, potentially even some that are more of a calico. Um, but there's also woolen ones that you wear in the winter time, um, which are going to be both for insulating and again, keeping your, your outer layers clean longer because they are so much more difficult to launder than a shirt like this. Um, in the case of a shirt, though, the shirt is not only the, the you know, closest layer to the skin for your upper body, but also for the lower half of your body, too. It was common practice for men in the time period not to be wearing any other kind of underwear, but effectively using the very long tails of the shirt and kind of tucking them underneath to give them the, the support, you might say, that they needed um, in a way of keeping their trousers cleaner and just like they were keeping their vest cleaner and their coat cleaner by wearing a shirt like this. Um, I'm even getting back to the shirt here. You can see the very long, uh, the very long cuffs here, the very long collar 
Those are all things that are going to be keeping the, you know, the sweat from your chin, from your neck, from getting all over the collar of your coat and things like that, or all over the collar or the, the cuffs of your, your coat as well. So they really are foundational garments that help to keep other things clean. That's really, really important. Um, moving on to the next slide, we can see some examples of some things that you might have as accessories for your shirt. Um, so we can see the plate here from the Workroom's Guide from 1838 showing all these different types of shirts and fronts and collars and things like that. And we have a couple of examples here. Um, in the upper right hand corner, you can see a replaceable collar. These become very common in the 1830s, um, where instead of having that taller collar that we saw in the earlier slide, um, you would have a, basically a very narrow band collar with a couple of buttons around it. Um, so in the case of this detachable collar, there's actually a buttonhole worked right into the front. So you would button it to the button that was helping to close the front of the shirt and then tie it around the back and that would hold it in shape. So there's a couple different ways they could do this. Um, below that, we have a replaceable front um, for the shirt. And there's lots of different styles of these. We can see this one actually right in the center of the plate. Um, a couple of above it is the example that's, that's the actual collar we just talked about. Um, so you can see the examples of how these are being taken from these advice books in the 1830s and taken into real life. And in the case of both of these, these are meant to be kind of a stopgap in some way. So say you are wearing your shirt for some reason you dribble onto the collar or onto the front, um, you know, or, or you spill something, um, this would be a quick way to basically change that having to fully change your shirt. Um, although I will say in the Workwoman's Guide, the author is a little judgmental and says, although these are okay to use, it's just a better idea to change your shirt if you soil it. Um, so these are certainly things that are around in the time period, um, but you know, used in, in varying degrees depending on the situation. And then the next slide, we'll see another plate from the Workwoman's Guide that also gets back to an earlier discussion we had looking at drawers. Um, so these, this plate actually shows everything from children's to women's um, to men's drawers from the time period. Um, we do have an example here going back to the uniform we showed earlier from, from John Minot Fisk. Um, these were actually the very heavily fulled woolen uh, drawers that came with that uniform as well. Whether they were worn with the uniform or not, I can't really say, but they came with his his clothing collection. Um, what's unique about these in comparing them to the actual image, and you can see the men's drawers are the ones at the furthest right in that slide uh, or that plate um, from the Workman's Guide. And you can see in that case, they're just basically shown as almost like knee breeches. Um, and in the 18th century, there were knee breeches that were effectively drawers that were cut in the same way, sewn kind of inside out so that you didn't have any seams rubbing up against the body. And that's basically what they're still talking about here um, in 1838 in the Workman's Guide. So in that case, those seem to be drawers that were more for, again, cleanliness, kind of changing those up more regularly than, than your trousers. Um, whereas the drawers we actually have shown here are meant probably more for warmth um, in the winter time. Um, getting back to the bathroom question that kicked this off as well, you can see there's also very easy access if you are having to go to the bathroom with this type of, of drawer. Um, so we know the foundational layers needed, but what about the outer layers? Do the interpreters get to choose what garments they wear? So again, starting off with our fabulous collection um, and kind of that expectation that I think a lot of guests have when they first encounter the village in the 1830s is that they didn't have a lot of color. They didn't have a lot of patterns. Their options were limited. Um, and what we find behind the scenes in the collections here and elsewhere is they definitely had a lot of options, not only in the types of fabrics, uh, cottons, wools, linens, and different weights and different weaves, but also um, the patterns and the colors of the 1820s and 30s and later are very vibrant. And to modernize, sometimes uh, a little bit crazy, a little bit garish, but wonderful. Um, so this is an example of a swatch book we have in the collection dated 1823, even though some of the fabrics uh, are kind of pasted over the date, so they may be a little bit later than that. But just page upon page upon page of these fantastic uh, cotton prints with these bright colors. Um, also page upon page of different types of brown. So if you thought there was only one type of brown, take a look through the swatch book and there are red browns, there are black browns, they're all different um, sort of tones of a lot of these colors that are being um, produced for folks uh, of the 1820s, 1830s and the like. So just really giving you a sense that 
the, the broad range of options that were available to folks. Um, so we have been working with various um, companies over the past, gosh, 30, 40 years um, to do reproductions based on our uh, quilts, our swatch books, our, our garments and gowns. Um, so these are just a few examples. Uh, again, this has been kind of over the, the past 30 years or so. So some of these, as wonderful as they are, are no longer available. Um, but you can see that some of them actually match the original fairly closely. Um, others, they've been tweaked. Uh, so the bottom one, uh, the, the company that did this one tweaked the scale a little bit um, for their particular line that we, they were putting out. Um, sometimes the colors show up a little bit differently. Um, what I've been finding oftentimes is they'll take some of those bright, vibrant lemon yellows that I adore. And uh, because they're, again, maybe not to the taste of their modern audience, toning them down a little bit or taking uh, fabric with a very bright white background and kind of tea dyeing it and antiquing it. So there are kind of layers. There are the patterns that we love and would choose. There are the patterns that they know will sell to modern audiences um, and the color palettes and the designs that folks are kind of looking for in the modern day. But usually with these collaborations, we end up with quite a few fabrics um, that are suitable for use in the village. Um, and then some, I have to say, I keep sending uh, different swatches, like the yellows in the bottom there, um, hoping that they'll pick up on those and do those, but to no avail. So I kind of had to step back and realize the 1830s and kind of living in this for a while now has kind of changed my aesthetic. Um, when I first started at the village and looked at some of the collections pieces, there was one particular gown and I took one look and said, oh my God, that is the most hideous gown I have ever seen in my entire life. The fabric is horrible and it has now become one of my absolute favorites. So your, your taste can definitely change. So hopefully we will fight the good fight and kind of keep uh, hoping that some of these bright, vibrant colors and these crazy patterns will get picked up um, by these companies that are helping us uh, do these reproductions. Um, and I know that Carrie utilizes a lot of these uh, in the historical clothing office. And then sometimes we go beyond that. <laughs> so you'll see some that we um, that we use the the collections uh, copied uh, fabrics as well. But in other cases, we go off of period illustrations to inform some of our clothing choices. So I did mention I'm a big fan of Halloween and our Phantoms of Firelight program. Um, and so last year when we created the whole new kind of uh, circus vampire programming that was the the tumblers and acrobats and the fire sisters and so on um, we needed to come up with an aesthetic for that so we actually reached back into history and found a number of 1830s um, opera uh, costume sketches from the opera uh, Gustav the third from um, by the the uh, written by Aubert and so we took this image on the left as part of a masquerade scene from this 1835, I believe, um, uh, opera costume that still exists in the libraries in Paris. And we used that and did an exact color match to have this fabric custom, um, custom created. So you can see some of those on the next slide where we're expanding that into next year. So those swatches in the center on the top are the actual color swatches that we created in our very modern Adobe uh, Photoshop um, to match exactly from the costume sketches and then had that printed to our needs so that we could use that to take inspiration from something that was historically correct. This year with our Phantoms programming expanding and having more performers and wanting to tie their look together, we worked with one of our really great college interns this um, summer um, and she created these sketches and expanded our fabric. And these just arrived. In fact, I'm just going to hold them up behind me. So like these just arrived, these were custom printed, um, for us. And, um, and so the brown on the lower right-hand corner is what we are going to incorporate into a second bodice uh, for a second aerialist that will be doing uh, wonderful feats up in the air. And then the gentleman who is part of the husband and wife duo that did the acrobatics last year, will making him a new vest tied into the black, um, the black Harlequin fabric as well. So these are cases where we took simple patterns, created them for ourselves. We are slowly working on creating more for that and 
but it's, you can go, you can go on to the next slide. Um, we are slowly working on creating more for that so that we can get some of those exact copies of things. Unfortunately, some of the designs that Rebecca is particularly partial to are sort of beyond a lot of our time and resources and design skills. Um, but some of the simplistic ones um, are not, so we can get that scale and the repeat exactly. Um, in the meantime, as we dress our interpreters, we're just trying to bring more nuance into the clothing they're wearing. So in the upper left-hand photo, this is from last year's textile weekend. So there's that pink, bright pink dress um, in progress there. And what you might notice is that all of those um, seated at the table are essentially wearing the same dress, same style collar, some match, some um, have ruffles. Um, and then if you jump down to the picture below that, you actually see um, three different dresses, more fitting, more corsets, different styles of collars. Some in cases, the necklines of the dresses are appropriate for daytime without the collars. Um, we have a child's dress done um, to the period as well. And you're seeing um, one of the reproduction fabrics being turned into new dresses um, for um, this year's textile weekend. And then even looking at the large um, photo to the right, um, you're seeing a variety of fabrics being worked into that quilt top. Um, I am told that quilt top started in the 1980s as a pot holder um, by junior interns and has now expanded. So it went from being a pot holder as it's English paper piecing, um, which is taking small hexagons of paper, wrapping fabric around them, and then sewing hexagon to hexagon. So it started at the size of a pot holder. It expanded to a doll um, quilt, and then it expanded to a crib quilt, and now it is the size of a full-size bed. Um, but it is a great record of the numbers of different fabrics that have been used in the village, many of which were copies of what you see um, from our collections. And so we look forward to sort of getting that off the quilt and off the quilt frame and onto um, a bed very soon. I promise, Rebecca, it's going to happen soon. Um, but even, you know, even with this, we're able to kind of bring in more nuance. You see one of the printed handkerchiefs um, on our interpreter here, right in the front on the striped dress. So she is wearing one kind of finished in. She is wearing um, stays or a corset. So she has that really nice posture and can't lean too far over. And kind of we're able to allow people to choose the colors and the patterns they want and also bring in some of the, the nuance and the details. And then go on to the next one. And then in some cases, we are definitely going outside the what um, we can get exactly associated with the village. Um, the fabrics you see are from a line, of a company that does not take from the village, but we do have a number, there are a number of fabric designers out in the world that love the 1830s as much as we do. And so they've been creating their own collections and copying them. And so um, still lots of browns, that's, that is a big popular thing, um, but designs that we couldn't, you know, we couldn't create ourselves. We're not shy about using them. I'm happy to take fabric from wherever we can get it that, that serves the needs of the, the village. We're also able to add things like um, having some custom hats and bonnets made. The bonnet here um, is one that we had custom made for us. It's gonna be making its debut, being issued to one of our interpreters this Friday. And it will be a regular bonnet that's seen. Belt buckles, again, things that are a little bit more unique. And we get to all of those kind of nuanced points with our basic measurement form, which you see on the left. And that we go through and kind of take a basic set of measurements. So it's pretty thorough. Um, and we walk everyone through all the steps so they understand what's being measured. But really the most important part of that form is that bottom corner where it says additional notes. And that's where we make note of, do you have favorite colors? Do you have colors you absolutely can't stand and don't wanna wear? Do you like stripes? Do you not like stripes? And we use that and always provide people's choices so that they can have autonomy in their, in their clothing. Um, and then we help provide the kind of rounding out the entire look. And then I think, Oh, yeah. On our last question. Yay. So were people smaller back then? What survives and what does it tell us about the people of the past? So I think the first thing that we have to look at is the kind of biases behind our collection. Um, the textile collection has grown um, through fabulous curators of the past decades to a great place now, but still 
it represents a very sort of middle class towards the nicer end um, of items that would have been available. So we kind of don't have a lot of clothes that are necessarily work clothes or um, kind of at a certain age, children's clothes tend to get uh, used and abused. So we don't have a lot of particular ages. Um, so we're kind of always on the hunt to kind of round out uh, the collection, but it kind of leads us to thinking about what gets saved, because a lot of what we have in our collection are things that people felt were worthy of being saved um, back through, you know, family history or whatnot. So thinking about what we save in our own closets today, in my closet, I have my wedding dress, I have my prom dress, um, things that are much too small for me now, but I save them anyway because they've got sentimental value or that pair of jeans that I swear I'm going to fit into again someday um, that I haven't fit into for decades. Um, but the garment that is on the far left-hand side is a gown that came to us with the history of being a wedding dress. Um, worn circa 1830. So again, something that clearly had some sentimental value, got tucked away and put away. Um, things that are, are special and unique. So the little frock is uh, for a tiny, tiny little newborn infant. It is the teeny tiniest and most adorable thing that you have ever seen. Um, I should have put a ruler in there to give it a little bit of scale with a little vest that you could pin in place. Um, that has a history of being worn by uh, young infant William Scarry, made for him by a relative who happened to be a tailor. So clearly this was a garment um, that was uh, something special to the family and got saved. And we all uh, oohed and awed over it and took one look and said, this has got to be a first child because as everybody knows, infants grow very, very fast. So the chances that this little boy was fitting in this for any longer than maybe a month tops, uh, pretty slim. Um, the dress to the far... Uh, rather the skeleton suit, sorry, that is right next to the uh, little frock coat there. Um, so sometimes things came to us with uh, a sadder story, things that got put away sentimentally because the person who wore them passed away. Um, so that's the case with this little skeleton suit here, which was worn by Roswell Shirtleff, um, who died at age five. So sometimes our, our collection is biased in terms of those, the sort of sentimental reasons people are saving things. And then sometimes it's just simply a matter of whoever wore this outgrew it, didn't fit anymore, and maybe it didn't fit anybody else in the family. It couldn't be passed down. The style changed and nobody wanted to wear it anymore. Um, so the dress, the white dress that's already uh, all the way on the right hand side, rather, is very tiny. So this has got to be a girl who's 12 or 13 or 14, kind of that, that stage where you're growing very quickly up and maybe not as quickly out. So thinking about that in terms of maybe that got put away um, because no one else fit in it and the styles changed and no one wanted to wear it uh, later on. And that became something that got saved and ended up eventually in the museum. But that being said, like today, people were all different shapes and sizes um, historically. Um, so the next slide just kind of, again, brings it back to the corsets and shows three different corsets. I took very quick, very unscientific measurements of these corsets, the Mary Ann's pair there. Um, fully closed. Um, so again, giving a few inches of wiggle room there, 20 inches. So not necessarily that she had a 20 inch waist, but that's uh, the measurement closed. The middle pair stays again, the same thing about 25 inches ish, maybe a little bit more. And then my favorite, the brown friend, a nice, comfortable 38 inches. So just showing again that People today were not the same size. People then were not the same size. It really is reflected in sometimes just what gets chosen to get saved. But luckily for us, they are all human sized and we find that we really specialize in fitting humans in the historical clothing office. So again, some of you might be familiar with this dress in this particular photograph. Um, so it was our dress in the weekend. It's the same dress I was wearing in the very um, beginning of the presentation tonight. And this was who it was made for last year next to the dress that it was copied from. So we proportionally changed it to fit her. Um, and it might look extreme, it might look like, oh my God, everybody was smaller back then. But the reality here is that the original dress, you'll notice is actually sitting quite a bit closer to the floor than our finished dress. Um, so we got a couple inches there. And also the original dress probably was for somebody who was maybe 410, 411, um, which is, very short for uh, for a human than Anne now. And our model we made the dress for is a little over 5'10", which is taller than Anne now for your average human. So it looks like a huge discrepancy in that photo, but it's because one was shorter than average and the other one's taller than average. 
So how we get one dress looking like another is um, going off proportions. So this very complicated looking form um, next to that is sort of the what we break down for um, those in our needle trades dressmaking program to sort of understand what measurements are important to keep design features proportional to the new body it's being made for. So we take measurements of all the extant um, relevant points, and then we take certain measurements off of the modern human. So if we know that the example at the very bottom um, box, so if we know that the um, extant has a 26 inch waist, but we wanna make it for a modern human with a 32 inch waist, which sort of tells us how much fabric to put into that. The original had a 97 inch width of circumference around the hem. We wanted to make it a little bit bigger. So won't make you all follow the math this late on a uh, Thursday evening, um, but trust me. And I say that we ended up kind of going up and giving the skirt about 120 inches of length. We still cut it into the same number of panels as the original. And we tried to incorporate how wide fabrics were then and what, you know, we cut some fabrics down, but that's what allows the dress to sort of look so similar on two very, very different sized bodies. Now that works well when we're going off of sort of design features for skirt, waist, bodice, but looking at the next one, um, there are some cases that we have to work off of kind of a base figure that isn't going to change um, the, the base pattern is not going to change size per person. This is uh, referencing a sleeve pattern, again, from the Work Woman's Guide, printed in 1838. Um, and you see here our historical clothing associate, Abby. Um, and I just freeze. There you go. Sorry, my computer hiccups sometimes, which I clearly just did a moment ago. Um, so you see our historical clothing associate, uh, Abby, who is, um, who created this sleeve from the work women's guide. And it is a half circle, not a very well drawn half circle in figure eight, but it is meant to be a half circle. And it creates this nice sort of pooling over the lower half of the tight arm. But it is for someone with a significantly different sized, um, uh, width of arms or circumference of forearm and length of arm. So you'll notice in the pattern um, in the lower right hand corner, you'll see that those are the different lines. So roughly where the teal arrow um, points to is where the original pattern ends. And then she was able to take the same overall size pattern, but just cut it differently um, and create a longer, deeper um, slit to form the sleeve. And that suited her exactly. So it's sort of a combination of using one giant sleeve pattern, but just cutting um, parts of the shape to fit her rather than changing the entire sleeve shape. And so that brings us to next one. Um, so it brings us to pants and some of the some of the other tricks of the trade that we're using here. We do work really, really closely with the collections and research department. And I'm very grateful that we have such a good relationship between historical clothing and um, with everything that they're doing as well. The pants on the left are a pair of um, uh, textured woven striped pantaloons um, that we use to inform us how pants should be constructed and good ratios of fit. However, they are a particularly a small size pair. Again, that tends to be what survives in collections as Rebecca mentions. Um, but we're able to combine the visible knowledge we get out of that one with looking at tailoring guides that are freely available um, through Google Books and archive.org, as well as some that we have in our collection and understand what the shape of the pieces should be. So this is from the Taylor's Masterpiece printed in 1840 by Scott and Wilson. This is printed in the United States, so it's a nice uh, source to have. And on the right hand side of the lower center image, you will see the drafting instructions or drafting outline for um, a pair of pantaloons. So this has the front and the back kind of combined in one um, in one sketch. And that's an ideal figure. So you'll notice that it's very long, thin leg. So it doesn't even quite match up with our originals either. Um, but because it is a master tailor creating some of these patterns, sort of gives us an idea of what the idealized look should be. 
We're then able to bring it all the way into 2023 and using drafting software, there's some open source drafting software that we use, we're able to plot all those points into a computer and spit it out, have it spit out a pattern. And that's what you see on the right. So that is for someone who works in here in the village, um, it is exactly his size. And we're testing patterns like that based on the tailor's manual drafting instructions to his particular size with the construction details of what's coming out of the collections. And we're testing these going into this fall. We're actually having two parallel pairs for him to try. So we can see what we're still getting right, what we're not, what we have room for improvement on and help kind of bring even higher levels of accuracy and comfort and style to everything we're doing um, here at the historical clothing office. Um, with that, I just want to say again, this is this is a collaboration between sort of interpretation, historical clothing, and collections and research. And for those that are able to visit the village, I highly recommend you come and take a look at the needle and thread exhibition that uh, collections put together. And in that exhibit, we have a number of pieces that are um, recreated from the original. So you can see kind of a duplicate that was made. We have a couple of changing cases that are on display as well. And it just really showcases how important it is to be relying on the originals, um, but also still kind of figuring out what works best for what we're doing in 2023. And I think that might wrap us up. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carrie, Derek, and Rebecca for answering all of these questions and for giving us insight into what people wore in the 1830s and how we strive to show that in the village. So now we have time for some of your questions. So the first question here is, are there any examples of fundamental garments for pregnant women in the collection? We do have, um a couple of gowns that I suspect may be maternity. One came to us, it's a black silk gown with a history of being, being worn as a maternity garment um, through multiple pregnancies. Um, so even though it was an older style gown, there was the family history that it had been worn later than was fashionable. Um, a couple of others that when we put them on mannequins, they're front closing gowns and it felt like for the style, maybe the waist was a little bit high, maybe to accommodate uh, a sort of pregnancy. But again, without that sort of history of being worn as a maternity garment, it was kind of a little um, speculation on our part. And then we have one really interesting uh, dress from the 1840s that is a nursing gown. Um, so underneath some of that beautiful bust pleating um, and gathering, it actually has uh, slits bound with some twill tape that make for um, easy access. Um, so we do have some garments in the collection that uh, are related to maternity and post-maternity. Did all women wear all these layers of undergarments regardless of their economic status in the 1820s to 30s, or was this limited to only women who could afford it? I'll take that one. And um, it's always, I'm doing it now, it's dangerous to use always, all, never, um, and so on, because there are always exceptions. But as a general rule, Yes, um, those that have sort of a female body are wearing some sort of support garments. What you will see is the range of styles and how much um, shaping was going into those garments. And one of the things I didn't mention earlier is we do see in our period, the um, terms corset and stays being used, um, are being interchanged, uh, inter used interchangeably. So they both refer to the same garment. And so you may see someone who's a little bit more comfortable with more structure, um, wearing one with more structure, one a little bit more lightly boned, just as we see today that people sort of get accustomed to one style of foundation garment, oftentimes will stick with that. It's also important to remember that the 1830s is still, um, there are still people that will remember what it was like to wear fully boned, almost like encased um, corsetry and, and stays prior to this. So at certain sort of age levels as well, it would just feel odd to suddenly get rid of all of that. The other thing I love about studying corsetry and stays making in this period is around the turn of the 19th century, so around 1800, is really when you say women see women taking over as the corset makers um, in the in the trades, um, and so it's the first time you also have women designing 
foundation garments for women. Um, and as someone who's dressed in clothing on a pretty regular basis from 1690s to the 1930s um, and some 21st century stuff, um, I will say that sort of the early part of the 20 of the 19th century, so the 1800 to 1830s, is one of the most comfortable pieces because it does support the natural curves of a woman's body without um, causing much, you know, it's not really stressing the body in that place. So yes, for the most part, the general rule is going to be wearing corsets. Thank you, Carrie. Tied to that corset question, how do women bend with the board running down the front? Not at the waist. So um, if you put your hands sort of on your hip sockets and bend forward there, um, you're going to be pivoting at your hip. Um, so your hip joint rather than at your waist joint. You can still always bend side to side at your waist in, in properly fitted corsets, and you're going to do a lot more bending at your knees. So ultimately, it's actually structurally better for your body. It's better body movement. Um, but you can, you can still bend and, and uh, do the things that you need to do. Take some adjustment if you're not using it, but absolutely. Awesome. Were handkerchiefs made locally or were they imported? I can take that one. Um, so there, there are multiple ways you could get handkerchiefs in the time period. A, a much more old fashioned way was to actually have them woven within a household. So you come to Old Sherbridge Village, you know that in the Fenno house, we do show a house that is doing textile production, doing kind of custom woven things like that. Um, I doubt handkerchiefs would be very common. Uh, again, like Carrie was saying earlier, never want to say never or always, um, but they seem to be a, from the handkerchiefs we can find in the museum collection that do have attributions and kind of dates roughly assigned to them. The hand-woven ones seem to be more of the old-fashioned style, uh, the ones that are made in the household, I should say. Um, most of the handkerchiefs in the time period are going to be imported. Um, the, the initial kind of inspiration for a lot of the handkerchiefs, the printed cottons and, and resist dyes, things like that, are all coming out of India. Um, they're still being imported from India in the 1820s and 30s. And the British are effectively making copies of those and sending those over to the United States as well. So there's also, of course, printing technology here in the United States for printing cottons, um, but they would have been things that would have come from a variety of different places and different means. Awesome. Tied to that handkerchief question, will we be able to buy the handkerchiefs at the village? Yes, yes. So in the agreement that we have with Burnley and Trowbridge, we will actually be selling them here at the museum. So you will not only see staff wearing them here at the museum, but you will get the chance to actually buy one for yourself to wear as well, or all three. No one's holding you back. So. <laughs> awesome. Speaking of dresses and cooking, is there any truth to the stories of skirts catching fire and killing the wearer? I can start with that one. Um, so we find that it's actually really uncommon and the few references that we've seen in newspapers tend to be kind of sensational. Mm -hmm. um, so generally speaking, I would say no. Um, you have grown up near a fire. You have been taught how to cook by a fire. So it's kind of, I think as modern people, fire safety is not necessarily something that we um, are comfortable with because we're not necessarily near an open flame all the time. But if it's something that you have been trained from a young age to watch yourself around the fire, be careful around the fire, um, I think folks are a lot more aware of that. Um, also, too, you might be wearing things that are less prone to melting. Obviously, we are in a time period well before polyester and all of the lovely modern fabrics that when you get too close to the heat of a flame or a fire will melt onto your skin, very uncomfortable. Um, but you might have spark catching on a, a woolen apron or a woolen gown. It's not going to set you on fire. It's going to smolder at the most. Um, and you'll probably be able to put that out pretty quickly. But I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything to that as well. Yeah, I'll just add to that, that uh, then a number of the, um, the limited number of examples of this, it's often someone falling asleep too close to the fire and not like actively working the fire. Um, we definitely have examples um, of clothing that has um, gotten scorched um, on dresses that have sort of burn holes, pants that have burn holes from, you know, working on a blacksmith and so on. But if you have much sense about you, you realize it pretty quickly. Um, the pants, I'd say pants and working around um, blacksmith is probably the more likely culprit um, or more common occurrence and that's not common by any means don't get don't take those words you know the wrong way um, but um, the those wearing dresses are also wearing so many layers that you might scorch the apron and you might scorch one layer of the skirt but it's not 
bursting into flame and actually um, ending anyone's life. And I, I will just say too, as as a site, like many other living history museums that prides itself on learning through historical or, or experimental archaeology, you know, trying to recreate the ways and the methods of the past by doing them ourselves, we have never experienced a fatality at the museum from someone burning up in the fire. And I honestly can't think of anyone who has luckily um, passed away due to a fire incident um, in a museum. So it's, it's granted, that's a modern perspective, but just just for some documentation from that perspective as well. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank One you. One more guys. reason not to let people sleep on the job. So yeah. <laughs> I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, this one is is there any evidence that tailors or seamstresses did finer work for miller, middle and upper class folks and sloppier work for those who are rather poor who could pay, pay less? You want to take the tailoring one, Derek? Yeah, I can speak to that. So I mean certainly going to a tailor is is a a custom experience so anyone who has ever had the the ability to go to a tailor in in a modern context in the 20th or 21st century knows you have a lot of options for how things will be constructed that would certainly be the same case uh in the 1830s but i also think it's important to note that the tailors were not the only way you could buy clothing that was not produced within the household there are ready-made clothing shops of varieties of degrees so you could go if you had a little bit more of an economical budget you could go to a second hand shop and buy clothing that had been basically resold like a thrift shop today um, but there were also ready-made clothing shops warehouses effectively by the 1830s and 40s that are selling completely finished garments of the newest style um, not made specifically for you and customized for you, but they could be tailored to you and customized to you a little bit more. Um, and then, of course, there was the upper tier of going to a tailor to have a very elaborate garment created, but there certainly was a spectrum of what could be created from the same tailor as well. Yeah, and from the, the dressmaking side of things, there definitely is less, um, honestly, pretty minimal ready-to-wear um, traditional women's clothing during this period, there was a secondhand market. So that's still, that's still very much an option. Um, but you actually almost have the converse. So if you are of more limited means and are going to have fewer garments, they're going to be kind of the, the best quality you could afford and probably a little bit more attention going into them because they needed to last longer. Um, Whereas the you sort of start going up the uh, socioeconomic scale, you're going to have dresses that definitely beautifully made by very skilled seamstresses that may have a lot of attention to detail, but they also weren't meant to last as well. So you're going to see what we would think of today as sloppier stitching, um, which more translates to larger stitching. It wasn't, these are garments that just don't have the stress of everyday wear on them. Um, so there was no reason to put, you know, the tiniest stitches in. The stitches will all be neat in a very straight line, um, but they may not be sort of as um, kind of as much overkill as we would think of wanting something to be made today. And then, um, and then of course, there will still be the ones that are made really, really beautifully um, as well that might be a dressmaker, you know, really kind of showing the, the top of her game too. Yeah, it's interesting. It's kind of like the opposite of today. Mm -hmm. All right, so our last question is actually something we were discussing before the webinar started. Um, they noticed that even though the early pink dress had big upper arm sleeves, they did, weren't using any arm pillows. Any reason for that? So to be fair, I did mean to take pictures with the sleeve puffs um, for that. We did a full dressing video, so you'll actually see that on our social media um, in coming weeks. Um, but uh, the sleeve puffs, um, certainly the size that you see and in, in, you saw in some of the collections pieces earlier in our talk tonight um, are for a little bit earlier period. So what we think of as sort of the 1830s extremes of the giant, giant puff sleeves is a fairly short lived fashion from in the mid 30s. By 1838, they're sort of letting the sleeves deflate. And so the bright pink dress that I was wearing and that was done uh, for textile um, dress on a weekend um, actually has four or five rows of ruching across the shoulder um, to really clamp it down. So the fullness doesn't start until um, my sort of lower, um, lower, um, right above my elbow. Um, you do see puffs placed there. Um, 
personally, I am not comfortable with elbow puffs. Um, it is it is a look and for the types of tasks and activities I tend to do at the village. It generally is not practical. Um, it's It just gets in the way of the things that I need to do. So as a general rule, you will not see sort of the elbow puffs and fullness um, here at the village. You will still see some sleeve puffs. Um, it is essentially the same exact sleeve. So as we saw the sleeve that, that Abby made for her dress earlier, um, it's the same sleeve, just some of more of it is sewn down or it's let out and a puff is put in there. So you could kind of refashion the dresses and stretch them across a longer period. So as with anything, someone who's um, a little bit more advanced in years and maybe holding on to an earlier fashion, they may still want to hold on to those sleeve puffs. Whereas someone new trading a copy of the latest um, ladies magazine amongst them and their friends, they may notice that the sleeve puffs have deflated and moved on and they're not going to include them. So. Awesome. That Thank answers you. the question. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that is all the time we have for this evening. If you didn't catch the entire program or you would like to share it, um, a recording of the webinar will be sent to our members in the following week, and it will also be uploaded to the Old Steerbridge Village YouTube page. And thank you again to our presenters, Carrie, Rebecca, and Derek, and to all of you for joining us tonight. I hope you have a great evening. Good night. <laughs>